So, uh, Pat McGibbon, thank you for coming on and it's Let's Talk With and it's Let's Talk With You. Um, I really appreciate you, you coming on the show to talk about your career, to talk about other stories and topics and everything. So, uh, kindly appreciate it for you to coming on. So, um, just wanted to say, though, it, it, it's amazing because when I get a lot of people coming on the show, you know, I always want to know that um, their backstory and, uh, you know, how... Uh, where they've come from, how they built up the characters and everything. Because for you, you, you're born in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, uh, born and raised. What was it like for you growing up uh, during the time in Northern Ireland where, uh, obviously, I hope you don't mind me talking about this, but it's like, the because the, it was all to do with the troubles and that. But what was it like for you just to be growing up, being part of that and everything? Yeah, I think, look, um, certainly... You know, you knew it was you knew it was about your race. Um, you know, I was I was very passionate about sport from a very early age. So even in primary school, any sport that was going, I was I was playing. Um, and and once I went into secondary school, although you know we were we were a school that mainly played the likes of Gaelic football. Um, we also had other sports such as basketball. We had cross country running. You know, we had had the soccer team as well. So, um. What what that did was it, it sort of I suppose veered me away from you know the, the, a, a lot of the troubles that were going on during that time, um you know even all my friends they they were very similar you know even the, the kids growing up we had went to the local park and kicked about with the ball rather than you know got in there I suppose mischief and that but it was yeah look it was it was difficult times and and certainly um we were aware of it um you know but. The, the most important thing was that sport, I suppose, kept us and the sport kept us away from it more than anything else. And uh, especially for you, because you want to play, you know, obviously for uh, Wigan, Manchester United, Porter Down, Glentora and that. And uh, and the thing is, I mean, I'm a I'm a Barry Town supporter and I know I do work a lot of, and it's based in South Wales. But I remember um, we uh, qualified for the Europa League a couple of years ago and we played against uh, Cliftonville. And it was my, and funny enough, I mean, it was the first time I ever went to Belfast. And uh, I just remember going there and I was just thinking, it, it just, it, it's, it's like I stepped on a different planet, you know, a different world, you know, it was just, it was just weird. And for, for Cliftonville, suppose, you know, they were very welcoming, you know, and very engaging. Yeah. It was just, it was just mad because when they were talking about, you know, sports and everything, it's, it's just how bonkers it was just to be around them. I thought, the heck, you know, it, it was amazing, uh, uh, but and fair play to Cliftonville. They just they knocked us out of the park. They beat us four 0 I thought, oh, they're too far advanced. And that's uh, fair play to them. But uh, you, like I said, you played for Porter Down. I hope I said it right as well. Uh, Glen and a few Northern Ireland clubs. Um, what was the Northern Ireland Premier League system or the Northern Ireland uh, Football League system? Um, what was it like to be playing for various clubs? And what is the you know, the difference between the Northern Irish League and playing for Manchester United? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I, when I first, just before I went to Manchester United, I'd, I'd left my local club, Lurgan United, to, to then go to Portadown. So I was over there. I think there were five or six of us lads that came from my local club at Lurgan United, then over to Portadown. So we we had a wee network anyway. So half, half the players from one team just went to the other and played within the youth team. So... Um, at, at that time in particular, I think in sort of the, the very early 90s, Portadown's senior team were, were quite strong. You know, the, the likes of Joey Collin and Mickey Keane and Brian Street and Alfie Stewart, they, they had a really good side. And I think they won, won the league for the first time under, under Ronnie McFall for a long time. So we I was sort of below that within the youth team. After, obviously, I played, you know, my, my 10 and a half years over in England and then went back home at, at again initially joined Portadown and you know was captain and them and them in the second year but then went to Glentoran uh, where I was fortunate enough to help, to help them win the league in, in 2005. So um the, the, what what you tend to find is that um I suppose what I said is at, at that stage especially at, at times and, and you can totally understand this because a lot of these people and, and, and players that were there have jobs. So it was a part-time league, but it also had a sort of part-time mentality at times. So 
I find that transition between playing full time and then going back to part time difficult. Which which I've spoken to other players, and it, it happens a lot because you have to then adapt the the to, to training on Tuesday and Thursday night, and, and just playing on a Saturday, and and you've been used to training every day. You know, you're pampered to a, a fair extent. You know, and getting your gear left out for you. You know that that changes. Um, but look, that's that's the whole idea of the adoption process. And and what I always said when I went to Club Touran was I wanted to finish off, you know, winning an a, an Irish League title before I, I, I hung up the boots. So you know, I was fortunate enough to do that. And that's um, those are those are wee memories and I suppose medals that they, that they can't take away. You mentioned Ronnie McCall, and I uh, I've got him on my li- on my notes here because you know he was manager of Portadown for nearly 30 years, I mean, 25, 29 years he, he was there at the club. And, and of course, you, you were there under him, you know, playing for him. Uh, would you, did you ever th- thought to yourself, because you did go into coaching uh, afterwards, but did you ever thought to yourself that you were going to be the one to re- replace him? Because it's, it seemed to me, from what I've read and from what I've researched, you know, he, I mean, he was Mr... Porter down. he was the man, you know, in charge of, every, uh, of the squad and everything. So what was it like to... What was it like under uh, Ronnie McFall, and what was it like to to replace him? Look, especially when I when I went back the the second time, and obviously I had played for for clubs in England and played professional football, and as, as going over there initially, sort of, I was one of the more experienced players, and then eventually took over the captaincy from from Big Benny Arkins. Um, the, you know, Ronnie was Ronnie was Mister Porter Down. He had sort of run the run the club for that length of time, and um, uh, so I seen it from a player playing side, but also was going through my coaching badges. So um, I'm not saying that Ronnie seen me as a threat, but sometimes the more experienced players are looking at what's um, what's going beyond that. So Ronnie Ronnie basically helped to, to build that club and a great success with them. I was at that transition between the playing and then going on to the coaching and management side. And, and funny, whenever um, I went down to the, the, the coaching and management side, Ronnie asked me and initially as physio, physiotherapist. And then, you know, I took over the job as caretaker from him. And then I was given the job full time. So I suppose it was a, it was a great honour to be asked to do that, especially considering that they, they, they weren't in a good state at that stage there was no no doubt about that and there was a lot of um, I think there was uh, eventually they had a 15 point deduction race there was a lot of things that had gone on beforehand which had uh, you know I was having to, to mop up um unfortunately I for, unfortunately or fortunately I also had the charity trying to be smart which I found it and I was doing a lot of work with them and I always said if I had to make a decision between trying to be smart and with what I was doing with Porter Down, I would choose trying to be smart because I had invested so much time into that and that's where it ended up coming to. Do you know when uh, with uh, Porter Down and uh, all the other teams in the in the Northern Ireland uh, Premier League, uh, what, what was Porter Down's main rivals? Who are the main rivals? Then? Is it Glen or is it another club? But who are the main rivals? Well, you, you tend to find the local rival would be Glenavon. So Glenavon are Lurgan side. So I'm actually from Lurgan, um, and the, the, it's ten minutes away from Portadown. So you always had that rivalry, right? you know, for the last number of years up until this year, I suppose that that, that wasn't happening because Glenavon were in the Premier League, Portadown were in the Championship. Um, but also then there was always a, a big rivalry with Glentoran as as well. And I know when I left Porta Down, and you know I'd been offered a contract by by Ronnie, but you know I I, I didn't think, considering I was I was captain, that it was you know a, a contract that I could take. And then I went to, to Glentoran. So you know some people seen that as a big thing, me going from Porta Down to, to then Glentoran. But like I've I've played big matches before in England and, and over here so that wasn't a, it wasn't a big issue from my perspective and uh, you went to Manchester United which is a, a big huge huge move for you I mean it's, it's without a doubt that will be like me from if I was playing for Barry Town I, I mean because they're in the Welsh can we Premier or Welsh Premier League that will be me going from there to Manchester United and that's a big step I've been going from the neck but when when you had that uh, transfer to Manchester United, 
Um, how did you find out about it? And I, it must have been such a shock to you just to find out that Manchester United, the one of the greatest English teams in, in the country, is, wants your signature and wants you to play for them. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it sort of came out of the blue. It was uh, a couple of weeks before that, Rami had had pulled me into the office and said that he that, that Port Vale were interested in taking me over on on trial. So I had sort of geared myself towards that. It was that particular year, ninety one, ninety two. I was working really hard. Very sad, growing. You know, I was I was a captain the the Northern Ireland schools and and was captain obviously the youth team in the reserve team and also. Um, on the fringes of Portadown's first team, so there was quite a quite a bit going on, and um, so I'd, I'd obviously heard about the Port Vale thing. It fell through, and then I actually was just playing a reserve match, and, and after the reserve match, I was I was told to come into the Romney's office, and I went into the, the Romney's office, and Eddie Coulter, who was the the chief scout over in Northern Ireland at the time, was there. They basically said to me, "Look, um, we want you to go over." Um, on trial to Manchester United so it was like you know as much as um, it would have been great to go to Port Vale you know whenever Manchester United offer you the chance to go over on trial uh, that's something else you know and it was and the, when I first went over I initially went over for a week um, but I was still I was still actually doing my A-levels at the time um, went over for a week I thought I would have went over because as an 18 year old we could we could play in the A team or the B team race you know so but they put me straight into Manchester United's reserve team and you had like you know you had people like Mick Phelan you know the, the Brian Robson all of those that were in and around that that setup and and all of a sudden you know you were you were training and, and playing with them so and that that particular game, I went over on trial. It was that we played Aston Villa, and I had to mark uh, Dwight York and and Daly and Atkinson. God rest them. So, you know that, that it went from marking you know somebody for Carrick youth team to all of a sudden marking Dwight York and and <laughs> Daly and Atkinson, which is a big transition. I I I mean, I if if I was around that time as well, I would have just been going, Jesus, I. I I think my mind, I, I know with Manchester United, you got to be, as a professional, you got to keep your focus, head in the game and everything. But to me, if you're trying to mark, you're, you're there going, Jesus, what's this going on? Oh my God, what is, what is going on? Because <laughs> it's going yeah. to be down to me. That's, that, that's the way it was. I mean, once once you get out on the pitch, you just have to focus on your job. And yeah. I must have did, I must have did well enough to then warrant the, the offer back. Because I think the initially, while I stayed for the week in the, the, the first trial, they they wanted me to stay longer, but because of my A levels, you know, I couldn't do it. But they then offered, to, you know, they, they asked me to come back then that summer, which I did then in, in July for for three weeks before I signed. And you know, when when we mentioned Manchester United, you know, when I was doing my research, obviously, Roy Keane is brought up a lot, and uh, I have to ask about Roy Keane. And there's obviously Sir Alex Ferguson in the class of '92 because you're around about the time it's just. The 90s, where the class of 92 was just coming in, you know, into the squad. And, uh, you know, of course, you got your boy Keane, who was, you know, the, the sort of coming in as the captain, as a leader. But, and then you got Sir Alex Ferguson, who was just Alex Ferguson, you know, you, you know, it, it's just the man, you know, the, the god of Manchester United. But I'll mention, I'll ask about Roy Keane first. And uh, when you were around Roy Keane and everything, what was he like? Because I, I mean, I've only met him once and it wasn't a very positive one because I asked for his autograph and he just looked at me as if to say no he just said nothing just looked at me and walked away I was there going oh okay but even the presence alone just thought whoa you know it's Roy Keane but what was it like for you to be around Roy Keane you know in the dressing room and you know at the club and that yeah look I mean you only have to look at at Roy's success with the club, you know, both as captain and from the very, you know, from he first joined, race to know that, you know, Roy's very driven, you know, very, very driven. And, and with that, you know, you, you, you're going to have times where he's maybe zoned in another place. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, you say that about Roy and, and but I have heard other people even, you know, Manchester United supporters and people that were over at the cliff maybe trying to get a, a an autograph at the time 
and he talked about other players and said, you know, they were a bit aloof and, and arrogant. But I have to say, uh, I never really seen that in the players were, but I also know that the you know the sometimes depending on where their lives were as well, and sometimes that's that's always the big one. So from Roy's perspective, you know, from from the minute Roy came in, I, I think I was I had actually been injured at the time, so I was in the cliff and in treatment, treatment and and I went up to the the canteen. I think Roy that particular day was was just ready to sign. And he, he was in doing his medical and that. So he sat down and I sat down with him for dinner because or for lunch because to be honest, you know, if any of the Irish lads, it wouldn't have mattered who they were, you know, he just sat down and, and you know, had a chat with him. So all was got on with Roy. You know, you have to look at the white of his eyes to know when, you know, to maybe be away from him for a wee while and give him a bit of bit of space in his but, you know, from from my perspective, really, really good pal and you know, as much as um, everybody sees, you know, the warrior that was on the pitch and, you know, how he protected not only himself, but his, his, his players when he was captain as well. Um, there, there's also a, a really good side to, to Roy. You know, I've actually a, a, a friend, Tom Moen. Tom's a Republic of Ireland under 19, 21 manager at the minute. And it was him that actually made the contact with Roy to get him over because I had lost contact with Roy at that stage. So, but... Tom told the story to all the young Republic of Ireland lads, you know, that as much as Roy was involved with the senior team, he actually went out of his way to go down to Everton and sit with the young lads and give them advice. You know, so that's that's the other side of Roy Keane that, that people don't see. And, and like everybody is as good days and as bad days. And unfortunately, you might have got them on a, on a bad day. You know, he's a big one for people saying please. though. <laughs> so if you didn't say please... Yeah, <laughs> I think I did that's say a, please. That's but, just the way Roy is. Yeah. You know? I think I, I think I did say a please, but I think it was <laughs> I, I caught him so off guard because, uh, and uh, I was only a kid when this happened because he was manager of uh, Ipswich Town right at the time, and um, and uh-huh. I, I just remember just being I'm just very confident, so I just went right. I'm just, I'm just going to go quickly go over and and try and get his autograph, but I think he right, had okay. to be in Ipswich at the time, so it's like oh. Well, the best one to do it, but uh, hey, how you? But, <laughs> it happens, yeah, yeah. But as I say, I know definitely he's got a really good side, them Roy, and I've, I've, you know, especially with the charity that he, that he came over and did the Q and A. He was he was terrific for it. Going on to Sir Alex Ferguson, you know, him being the manager. I mean, he is. It's like uh, with with Ronnie McFall, you know, he's Mister Porter down, but then it's just. Versus Alex Ferguson, you know, and uh, a lot of people could say that he's Mr. Manchester United or the God of Manchester United. But then a lot of people could say a lot of things about Alex Ferguson. People can say a lot of things, you know, what he's done for Aberdeen as well, you know, and uh, and all sorts. But as a man, I mean, I I do want to ask some of the cliche questions because I know a lot of people are going to be asking, you know, what's he like you know, and what kind of manager he is and everything. But for, for this particular one, what was he, you know, as a, as a, as a person to be around, uh, did he have that presence where if you walked into the room, everyone was just hush, you know, because uh, this man, you know, this godlike figure at Manchester United is coming through. He's the manager. He's, he's a man's manager. Uh, what, what was the presence of Alex Ferguson uh, like for you and the other players? Yeah, look, I mean, he he did have that aura about him that you know, once he came into a changing room, everybody stopped and, and sort of listened. Um, but I always say that he was he was great, especially with the the young kids. Like he from from a very young age, sort of under twelve, under thirteens, where the kids were playing not at, 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 at academy as such, but they played games as part of the under age teams and. You know, he was there watching all of those games, and he knew he knew the club, he knew the people inside out, not just the playing staff, but but you know, for whether it was the the tea lady, whether it was the admin staff, whoever it was, he always had a, a a word for them and a nice word for them, and I think that's that's how he he built it. He built it, you know, from within, and um, that it wasn't all about the players, and the players were just a part of the cog, you know, so. Um, yes, 
he had the you know you, you got the hair dryer treatment from him at times and, and but that was all part of it and, and he was structured and he was disciplined and he came in at the same time every day and but but the other side to him was you know whenever you had to knock the door and have a chat with him that door was always open you know so and that's the the, the, the that's thing I suppose that you wouldn't see all the time but that you know especially the lads the class of 92 that went on to do so amazingly well will say it. you know even even back so you know obviously there was that incident in the, in the, the dressing room but you know they've more than made up and he knows exactly what what Sir Alex did, did for him as well as the other lads Mentioning, you know, when you started, when you were playing for Manchester United, uh, of course, there were a lot of injury problems that you sustained during the, the course of your time at Manchester United. And obviously, you went on loan at um, Swansea City and you went on loan to uh, Wigan at first. Um, but during th- that period, what was, going, what was going through your mind at the time when you were sustaining all these injuries and, you know, and you're bouncing to... Uh, Swansea to Wigan and obviously going back to Man United to do some training with them. Well, was there a time when you think to yourself, maybe you the, the uh, because when it comes to professionalism, especially the the um, the requirements to keep fit in Manchester United, it's not just Man United, but probably just like uh, Chelsea and Liverpool and all them clubs. You know, there's always that standard of needy professionalism and to keep fit in that. But what was going through your mind at the time? Was it was it a bit stressful for you because you're having these injuries and because you need to you wanted to get back in? What what was going through your mind at that time? Yeah, look, look, it was it was very frustrating because at at the start of that final season, ninety seven, I had played in, in quite a few of the preseason friendlies with the first team and was was in and around it, and you know, I was hoping again that. And again, it's dependent on injuries. It's dependent on, especially during that time. The gaffer, if 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 the the first eleven were fit, the vast majority of the times he played off that, and it wasn't where his squad rotations are now. You know, if if the the senior players and and the best players were fit, then then they played. You know, because they were constantly chasing for leagues, and and they were right at the very top end. But I had I did well enough at the end of the season before and the start of that season to, to be in and around it and that's I suppose why he put me out on loan you know to Swansea and the first game although it's it's different because you play reserve team football race and it's you know as much as you, you still have to pass the ball and head a ball it's not as competitive so when we played Doncaster I'd, I'd been pleased with the way things had gone we were playing against it was actually you know Doncaster and I, I always remember Mark and Darren Moore big darn from from set pieces you know but we won that we won the game one nil and i think dave penny was playing uh dave was in that group as well so he was a captain of swansea at the time and the will be his manager but then i got injured in, in training at united the following week so only i had actually played one game and the, uh, I badly damaged my knee. I had, I had, I had two operations on that knee and I, I damaged both my medial ligament and, and tore my cartilage. But at the same time, I was actually having real problems with a, a, a double hernia as well. So in and around, I always remember this, in and around Christmas um, of that year, sort of 96, 97, I, was, I had had a my second knee up. And while I had my second knee up, I ended up going in and getting surgery from a double hernia with with thirty seven staples across my stomach, and I could just about get up, you know, to go 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 towards the Christmas um, <laughs> period. So it was it was very frustrating, you know. But gradually things came round, and and my knee started the 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 settle, um, and then it was at that stage that I went out on loan to Wigan, and and I have to say the first couple of games at Wigan, again it was trying to get back into it, um. And but after those first couple of games, then as my confidence grew and I got used to playing com- the competitive football again, things went great. And obviously, you know, I was fortunate enough to score the goal that, that got them promoted. And then we we ended up we won the league as well. So I was at a crossroads. That 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 time ninety six to ninety seven was was very frustrating, you know. But when it came to the end of it. I actually felt valued, especially whenever you know I was a as a good part of that that really good squad at Wigan Athletic as well. So 
I just had the, the then have the conversation with the gaffer about what was going to best suit my career because he would always be honest and he, they, the, the club had offered me a couple of years. My, my best mate, Kevin Pilkin at the time at United, they'd offered Pilks a, a deal as well and they, they'd offered me a couple of years and it was, I was thinking to myself, well, I have to make a decision and I was turning, you know, I was almost 23 years of age at that stage. Um, so, after the, the the chat with the gaffer, then you know says like go out and get competitive football and 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 play a, you know play a competitive football. One last question about Manchester United, um, and again going back on what I always said about the research, uh, the the one game that always comes up is the one against uh, York City, where Man United lost three 0 and you got sent off. What happened? Uh, well, I, I just basically mentioned. I said, like, "What happened at the game? Where you got sent off and lost three 0 But, uh, but for your experience, because um, it was a cup, it was a cup tie, wasn't it? I think it was the football yeah. league cup tie. And what was um, what happened on that evening through your perspective? And who was playing? Um, who was the starting eleven for Manchester United against York City? Yeah, look, I can't. I couldn't even go through them all at the minute, but I, I do know that obviously Big Pally was playing because Pally was playing alongside me. I, I've said this before. This it was the first time I played alongside Pally in a in a competitive game, and uh, you know when when it came to the sand and off, we tried to play offside, and then I had to chase back. So, you know, the, these things happen and are part and parcel of football. It's not what I would have liked, and wasn't the way I would have envisaged my debut to go. Um, but the, the the team itself, there were there were younger players, but there were also you know more senior players. So the likes of Dennis Irwin, Paul Parker played at the time. Race said, I think Sharpie played, Gigsy and O'Brien McClure, Brand played as well. Um, so you had look, you had good players, but on on the night, I think York scored from longest range in the first half, and then but we were still well in the game within that and. Obviously, as I chased back, I, I realised that, you know, there was going to be a good opportunity. So I took Paul Barnes down out, outside the box. But the linesman managed to get it wrong and, and they flagged to, to, to give it inside the box. So as well as getting sent off, then they give away, they, they give a penalty. So, look, it's it's frustrating and it's part of history now. And it's not something that I could take away. But if anything... And that's why some, you know, I talk about obviously the resilience factor with what I do with mental health as well. Now, you know, what happened a few years previous with my brother and that, that you know, puts things into perspective. When in the next day, uh, you know, the, the, the as as much as it's demoralising at the time, you have to get over it. If you want to be a professional footballer, you're going to have good days and bad days, whether that's at Barry Town race or whether that's. At the, at the top end with United, it just means that it's more highlighted. And, yeah. you know, you have to have quite a, you have to have a thick skin, you know, to, to be able to deal with that. So. Yeah, no, I, uh, I agree with you. And it's, because uh, it can be very, it can be very daunting sometimes when, um, when it comes to playing football. I mean, I, it's like with, uh, with Barry Town, you know, uh, a lot of the, well, it's the same as semi-professional football, but most of these players are former professionals. And I, 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 I mean, David Cottrell, you know, is one of them, and he runs the David Cottrell Foundation for Mental yeah. Health and everything. And uh, and I, I mean, I spoke to him, uh, I spoke to a few of the players as well, and they always said the same thing. Those who uh, have come from a professional background, they said, look, you you do sometimes have to get over it because as a professional footballer, you know, you just have to. It's it's like a, it's sort of like a duty thing most of the times because you're playing for the club and you're and you're part of that club that's maybe given maybe push them to better opportunities and a, and a huge success in the future, you know, and, um, and sometimes it could be physically and mentally draining. And uh, I mentioned, I'll probably mention it towards the end of the podcast, where it's about the mental health and everything. Cause you, you yourself, you know, you work with, in mental health uh, and you're a mental health coach. Uh, I'm, Am I right? Yeah, mental health and well-being coach. Yeah, yeah. Cause I've got it down a big catalog that says like mental health. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, it's like me with me being, I'm such a, not a perfectionist, but it's like, if I say one thing, I'm there going, oh, did I mean to say the right thing or whatever? Because, you know, some people take care of it. Yeah. But luckily, I've not had that. So I'm actually going to do something right. But um, let's talk about Northern Ireland, the, the national football team. Seven caps, you won, and uh, you played alongside 
you know, Ke- uh, hopefully you played alongside it's like Keith Gillespie, you know, is uh, Aaron Hughes, Neil Lennon. Um, I mean, some of the big names in Northern Irish football, I mean, huge names for Northern Ireland. But when you got that caller to come and play for Northern Ireland, that must have been a huge honour for you. Yeah, look, I mean, the, the thing about it was I, I was still I was still on the, the fringes of things at United. I was, I was playing for the reserve team, I think, that particular time against Blackpool um, in the Lancashire Cup. And, and Billy Bingham, who was the manager at the time, um, he was watching the game. So the, the lad that I was marking was a big centre forward called Dave Bamber. And Dave had made a you know a great career for himself in the, the lower leagues with, with Blackpool and that. So um, I must have did well enough to, to be asked by, by Billy then into the squad quite young. So I was on the, the fringes of that squad. And, you know, you talk about Keith. And Keith was obviously a, 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 a teammate of mine at, at United. But also he was Keith was in my digs as well. So I know Keith really well. But when I first went in there, even before Keith came in, you had Mal Donaghy, you had Alan McDonald, you know, you had Tommy Wright, you had Jimmy Quinn. You had some really, really good players there. And I was on the fringes of things over the, the, the first couple of years. But then after, I think it was 94, maybe, after a couple of years, I know that, that, that Billy Bingham then sort of stepped away from it. And then there was new players came in. So a lot of the Premiership players, so the likes of Michael Hughes, um, Big Tags was already in it. Lanny came in. You know, there's really good players within that as well. So I wasn't, I was obviously training with, with top class players when I was at United, but also, you know, even in the Northern Ireland squad, I always say this, people don't realise just how good Neil Lennon was as a player until you actually trained with him. You know, Neil never gave the ball away. I know people talked about um, the other side of it, you know, that he wasn't going to play a 50-yard pass and everything was sideways. Neil Lennon was, was the, the if, if he wasn't the best in the, in, the, in the Premier League at that time, he was one of the best in the Premier League at what he did. You know, and, and I suppose Martin O'Neill seen that in him. So you had, you had quality players throughout there. Um, you know, I was on the fringes where I was trying to, to, to make sure that I was playing club football race. And, you know, at times I, I, I put presidents of it over the, the international group, to, to be honest, at times. But that was because it was my bread and butter as well. And as much as playing for Northern Ireland meant a lot when it, when it came to it, I, I was making sure as well that, you know, my, the most important thing was, was keeping my place within the Wigan team because that's where I was in the squads most of the time. And let's, let's mention about Wigan then. Um, and i got a couple of questions left anyway because I normally, with these, let's talk with podcasts. It's only just, just under an hour anyway. But let's mention Wigan because I've, um, I mean, I, I've sort of worked under Dave Whelan but in DW Sports still was still there. <laughs> but, uh, but for you, when when you went to Wigan, um, you, you've you were there for a few years, made over 150 odd league appearances. You know, you helped to gain promotion and everything. You know, and um, did does Wigan hold a special? Let me see that again. Does Wigan hold a special place in your heart? You know, and especially that what you've contributed to the squad. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I said it, I mean, I spent five years at, at Manchester United and, you know, there's a great fabric at the club, not just from the playing perspective, but all throughout the club. You know, there was a very friendly club and you, got, you, you knew everybody, even though it was such a huge club. Wigan were the same, there was a great fabric to it. Dave Whelan, you know, was was obviously a hometown boy that, that they ended up doing really well, you know, from a business perspective. But, and and I always got on great with the chairman, you know, as, as much as he was hard, he was hard, but he was fair. Um, so w- Wigan, to me, were terrific. I think I played, in the end of I played 213 games for Wigan, which was brilliant. You know, I mean, I, in, in the five years that I was there, the, the final year, Paul Jewell, maybe, you know, we, the, uh, with managers, they've all the, their own opinions, you know, but I always remember that, the time it was uh, towards the end and I, I tw- towards the end of my final year and I actually went out on loan to, to Scunthorpe and things had gone well under Brian Laws in the six games I think we won five and drew one and I'm not saying that I was the be all and end all in those results but we had managed to get a good run with them on loan and then they, they wanted to take me uh, uh, sign me on a contract but 
it didn't suit myself and my, and, and my family at the time. So Dave Whelan, the, the, whenever I told him that I wasn't going to be moving and I was just going to see my contract out, uh, Mr. Whelan decided to bring me into the office at, at Christopher Park. And we had a, we had a, a, a frank exchange of views, but not, uh, um, you know, walked out of that, that room. And, and uh, I think I was sent with, with Ian Kilford to train with the, the youth team that particular Friday. Um, but then by the Monday, I was back in with the first team, and and you know what, you see, the, the come the end of the season race, I always remember the final day. I think it was against Colchester, and Dave Whelan came over and shook my hand and wished me all the best. And you know that that's that, that's the man. I always got on with Mister Whelan. He called a spade a spade, um, but the, the, you know with a lot of respect for him. Let's go into, uh, like I said, I saved some of the best lads because you're a mental health coach and uh, you work, you're working with a lot of people with mental health um, issues and everything. And uh, uh, I must say, and I'll probably um, be, be honest now, it's um, nothing to do with me. I've I, I got a fiance and she's been battling because of a lot of things personal, and especially COVID, is, it's not helping matters at all. It never does. Well, it, it never will help matters, but uh, a lot of personal problems have been growing in mountain and it's affected uh, my fiance um dreadfully and you know and it, it can be you know um it, it lead to other things and luckily thank god it didn't but uh you know with you as a mental health uh, coach um what do you um what do you help with others how do you coach them into from your experience and how do you process and do a step-by-step with others to help them get on the right path and everything who, who suffer from mental health issues yeah well i think just that i suppose the, the the understand where i i got to or where i now am at the moment compared to where i was because you know i i finished my, my football and career racing and went into physiotherapy which was very clinical you know but I find very early on that, that the physio wasn't for me. Um, it was just too clinical. And I was used to a changing room and that environment of speaking to people and, and you know, having conversations with people. So in a roundabout way, I always say now that when, you know, when I find a train to be smart and I've, I've now gone on and did the health and wellbeing diploma, it's, it's my, my brother's death through suicide is almost my driver. So, you know, when I was struggling, I suppose, with my identity after finishing the football because everybody says I oh, there's there's the boy that used to be a footballer and they do this a lot with the other other players as well you almost lose your identity so I had to find my passion back again and it was once I did the the sort of mental health you know always said I, I, I believe that Philip my brother is my driver within all of this but it's basically a, a lot around having conversation and actively listening to people you know because sometimes um when when it comes to mental health, everybody has their own personal story within it, and you know how one person deals with something is not necessarily how another does. You know, I think it's important to have some sort of structure within your your life, and obviously, you know, the five steps to well being are the big ones that, that that I would coach around. So, you know, that's things like being active, you know, stay connected. So, and and even even us doing this. You know, virtual interview. You know, is is that connection, um, and that's really important. You know, take a notice of all the good around. But and I have to say, when the first lockdown happened, race. You know, especially with the weather being good, and I got out, out to the backyard and and had a great time just <laughs> finding nature. Um, it actually, I I started to actually really appreciate the things that I had rather than chase after the things that I didn't. You know, so take a notice is another one. Learn, learning new things, and finally the big one, the other one is give. So well, that's given the charity. You know, given your time to uh, have it. The, the, those surrounding those five traits are hugely important, and having some structure. And we are are the, the, the charity trying to be smart. You know, the, the the logo that we have is it smart to talk, and. You know, people talk about you know it's okay not to feel okay, and it's 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 good to talk. It's actually, if, from my perspective, it's very smart to talk and share your anxieties because it's that whole that simple one of you know a problem shared is a problem halved. 
And sometimes but people don't know. It's a little bit like what we talked about with Roy Keane. If you don't know what's going through Roy Keane's head at that particular time, sometimes, you know, it's it's not necessarily the best thing to judge. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a big thing, whether it's, you know, whether it's somebody that... Um, is a, is a friend, whether that's somebody is, is a family member, you know, it, it, it's sometimes if, if you've nothing good to say, sometimes don't say anything at all yeah. and just count the 10 because you, you, you know what it's like, Reese. At, at the moment, there's a lot of people in, you know, confined spaces are not able to go and do the things that they're, they, you know, they maybe want to do. So it's about having, being mindful that, you know, keeping some sort of routine, but also being mindful of the fact that other people will have their own personal journey with them. Oh, yeah, no, I 100% agree. And you know why? It's um, it's like with, with my fiance. she's, um, I, I've learned a lot from her because of the anxiety. Because when, when I first heard about the, when I started to know when people started expressing about anxieties and everything, um, I, I will self uh, admit, I was a bit selfish of, of saying, oh, it's just a little, you know, oh, not to the extent of oh, they're, they're not making it up anything. It was just like when people say anxiety, they're seeing it. I always thought, stop using it as a, as a tool. But then when I met my fiance and everything, and she was, you know, and I, it's like going being thrown into the lion's den or thrown into the deep end where uh, I started to be around her. And, you know, and I remember the times where um, she would, um, uh, she doesn't like staying out. She's like, no, I, I got to, I, I can't stay out. I, I've got to go home. I've got to go home and be confined into it. And all other things, you know, I, I mean, I could talk talk for Wales, you know, or talk for North Island about it, you know, and uh, expressing it. But yeah. um, <laughs> but I, I understood yeah. it a bit more, you know. I understood it a lot more. And I actually, you know, and I always stand up for yeah. people. If someone say, it's all in your head or it's all of this, it's still, I think, no, it, it's, it's more than that. You've got to experience it, whether it's from yourself or whether it's from other people. Personally, you know, you, you got to experience yeah. it, and, and it's a big wake up call. Shoot. Yeah, and I do, I, I, I do think. I mean, looking, and I'm not a big one for statistics when it comes to sort of mental health issues, and you know, leading to self harm and suicide, because you know, within all those statistics, there's a person and everyone, you know. So I'd be a big one surrounding that, but. One of the big ones that that they talk about is that whilst. Uh, girls and and women would you know maybe be anxious and and have depression and and have you know maybe lead to self harm. In terms of statistics and suicide, it, it's more towards men, and mm. that's because well, uh, the 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 summation is that you know a lot of times men just don't want to open up. Whereas you know even the fact that your fiance has opened up to, to admit that. Um, is hugely important and that's a very brave that's a very brave thing to do you know because we all have our mental health you know i i don't know if i've ever, ever told this story on on video but um you know it was a couple of months before it was actually a couple of months before roy roy Keane was due to come over and at that stage i had put myself under a huge amount of pressure you know i'd, I'd basically given up the physio business um in order to, to to find the charity and was putting 60 70 hours a week voluntarily and i put on weight you know i was drinking too much i was doing doing a, a lot and this particular morning and it was actually the tickets were coming out for the roy keen gig so we had very little finance at that stage but the the q a obviously helped in terms of a big fundraiser in the end of there was a guts of 600 people went to the, the, the roy's gig but this particular morning, the tickets had just come out, race, and I was sat with with my son actually at the time and a and friend, and I could feel myself going in and out of consciousness, and it was sort of I, I was feeling sort of dizzy, and I was thinking, what's going on here? And the mate said, look, you're you're looking grey, you know, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm not feeling good, and I was actually sweating, race at the time, really sweating, but going in and out of consciousness, and I was forty two, I think at the time, um. And it ended up the, the, the doctor on call had to, to come in or the paramedic had to come in, put me on the, the heart monitor. My heart rate was at 240 beats a minute. It was, yeah, I was put in an ambulance, you know, I was put in an ambulance and I was brought over. And in the end up, it was what you call an SVT, a superventricular tachycardia, which 
basically is a panic attack. And, you know, but it just shows, you know, that 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 whole mental and emotional strain actually led the sort of physical symptoms as well. Very, very serious physical symptoms, you know, and I've, I've turned things around and, and I have to say Roy Keane was a, a big part of helping that and actually getting some finance behind the charity and actually giving us profile. So, you know, I, I totally understand, you know, when it, when it comes to it, there, you know, there's a, there's a whole, I suppose, um, the whole thing surrounding mental and emotional well-being and at high it links to your physical well-being is hugely important, Rice. Yeah, no, and, and I really appreciate that you were being open and honest about that, you know, especially on video. And, um, and because the, the video, uh, especially with this uh, podcast, it's, it's going in and out, but the, the, the voice and the, the audio is perfectly clear so everyone will be able to listen and hear your story. And I really appreciate you telling me this story. And if you just noticed, I turned on uh, because my fiance walked in with a bag. He was there going, sorry, sorry, sorry. And it just walked out. I thought, no, nah, it's okay. Yes. <laughs> Fair play to her. But uh, sorry. No, no, but in all fairness to her, it's like, it's like with me, um, you know, I've had uh, my ups and downs. And, uh, and the thing is with me, it's like you said, because men tend to bottle it up sometimes because, you know, it's, it's whether or not you call it a masculinity thing or whatever. But, it, it, you know, for me, it's, I think it's just, pride not masculine it's like a pride thing but because i want to look after you know people around me but my um my, my missus my fiance kept saying to me don't bottle it up so i never want you to and she literally had a proper future wife having a go it's like if you bottle it up i punch you in the face and uh, <laughs> so she was yeah. like oh, I'm afford, I always told her. what's that sorry uh, yeah so i mean sometimes it's just a Sometimes it's just our primal instinct to do yeah. that, to, to, to think that everything's you'll just man up and that's it. Yeah. But, um, you know, that the, the whole message around and it's smart to talk uh, about our anxieties, I think is a really, really powerful message. I haven't got the wristband on at the minute, yeah. but we, we have actually a wristband for, with the charity and, and basically it's yellow and half and it's blue. And oh, that's my team spellers, yes. <laughs> Yeah. So it says it says it's smart to talk, right? And on the blue it says it's it, you will stupid. Basically, if you're feeling okay, you wear it with the yellow side up. And if you're feeling blue, you turn the wristband and it's blue side up. So it's just a very simple visual uh, with the charity. And I think that it would work really well, not only with, with what we do, but also with associated clubs and organizations, because it's a very simple message, and especially for the kids as well. You know, you know. Um, I, I'll say this uh, as well because um, uh, there's sort of into two things. It's like uh, one, uh, apart from my, uh, uh, my my missus, I always speak to either um, my bamp or grandfather. Really, uh, my um, mm-hmm. uh, to speak to him. I always go and speak to him, and he's and uh, you know, and he's a proper. He's been in the navy. He's been in this, but he's always said one thing. Uh, he's always said one thing. He says, "Never ever be afraid to talk to me about anything." Because I'm your bamp and that's what I'm here for. And that's what, and my dad as well. My dad's always said, look, mate, you got my phone. It's and he's always said, he said the same thing about my bamp said, don't ever be afraid to talk and to open because mm-hmm. we're there for a reason, you know. And another thing as well that I always yeah. to mention because being a football is self, it's like the same goes for a lot of men, or probably for women as well. Um, it's they always say football is life, you know, because um people not always specifically rely on, you know, the sport itself to break away, but it, it is sort of, you know, for, for fans, maybe, and particularly footballers, you know, because they love, you guys love the sport. But if it's like for footballers, you know, you, you tend to, because when they mean football, it's like, because you forget all the problems and everything because you're, the passion and the drive and the adrenaline is all focused on you guys playing, you know, and it's, it takes it away. And, and when people say, oh, I don't get football or anything, and people say, because it's life and, you know, you, you have to understand, you know, when you go to the games and you experience, you know, walking up the steps yeah. or you hear the atmosphere and everything and you see the players and the passion drama, as soon as you experience it, then you'll know why a lot of people, um, you know, always see football as life and they always rely on trust. It's like I always play FIFA just to keep going until we're all back in, you know, and... Uh, um, but uh, it's exactly. And the final thing I want to say is, um, because you, again, you mentioned uh, Roy Keane and everything. So what, what's the uh, charity again called? I just uh, want... Yeah, the, the, the charity is called Train to Be Smart. So Train to Be Smart Juniors. Now, 
we we've got a, a YouTube channel, Train to Be Smart. So that's Train, and then number two, Big B, uh, Smart Juniors, and we've got a YouTube channel that shows it of some of the clips with Roy and with with Sir Alex um, in 2017. We're actually showing the full Q and A with Roy because it's just, it's five years since he did it on, on the fourth of February. So we're showing that the full Q and A, which I have to say is is TV gold, race. It yeah, really I'm, I'm is. Watch it um, on our YouTube channel. So, if, yeah. So, and if you can, if you can say to people just to subscribe to the channel because we're sitting, I think, on seven hundred or eight, seven hundred and eighty people. But if we could get that thousand subscribers, that would be brilliant, and it it will be TV gold. It really will. Do you know what? What I'll do is I'll get the YouTube uh, channel link and the video link, and I'll put it in the description below. Just say, look, just just watch this, like, share, and subscribe. Do that thing, you know, and I'll do that for you, no problem at all. Yeah, and brilliant. That, brilliant. La- last thing I want to ask you as well before we conclude this podcast, and I always ask this um, mainly on my other podcast on because I got Dragon's Voice podcast, which only focuses on Welsh football. But I thought because you're a footballer, I'll ask you this. How do you look back on your on your career? It, it, it's it's a difficult one because you know as footballers we tend to you know you, you tend to never look back, especially on the playing side of things. It's only once you get to this stage of of my life that you look back and you say, uh, you know, some of the the the, the memories, some of the people that have met along the way, some of the you know some of the experiences, you know, good and bad, um, they've they've just helped make me and and and. It's from a footballing perspective, you know, I went over my 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 dream was always to get paid for something I love doing, you know, if, whether it be Nacken to Stanley or Manchester United at that, that stage, it was just to worked hard towards it. And, you know, to then go to a club in which in the five years that I was there, you know, in 1992, the one that, you know, 293, the one that the league for the first time, I think, in 25 years. And, you know, whilst I was only on the fringes of things, I, I understand that. I still had so many great memories from it, and then with Wigan, it was exactly the same to play at Wembley twice, race and you know in front of sixteen, seventy thousand people, you know, um, the 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 play international football for Northern Ireland, the, you know, the, the teammates like Roberto Martinez, as you say, Roy Keane, David Backham, actually said that you know you played alongside them at times was just terrific. Well. But thank you so much for coming on the podcast just to talk about your football career and you know the important mental health and your charity. So I really do appreciate it for you taking the time just to come and talk. Really, that's uh, it's absolutely amazing. And thank you so much. All right, thanks for the invitation, Race. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Take care. Okay, all the best. Bye. Bye.